My name is Vincent Everts, and I'm talking to Rachel Halsema, who works for the World Bank. And actually, Halsema is an extremely Dutch name. And uh, I don't know if you're related to the Dutch, uh, Rachel. Yes, I am, by ancestry. Okay. But I don't speak Dutch, so okay. someone's going to have to teach me when I get there. Yeah. So you're part of the <laughs> blockchain, uh, the blockchain uh, uh, lab in the in the World Bank. You're coming to the Blockchain Innovation Conference on uh, on June the seventh. What are you going to uh, discuss during your uh, during your talk, and what what kind of message do you want to convey? I'm going to talk about our journey with blockchain as a development organization, and the the message that I would want to convey to anybody working in this space is that the the challenges that face developing countries are are difficult, and they are cross border in nature. And blockchain is a really exciting place to start to explore those challenges. And even if it doesn't end up being the solution for those challenges, it helps us understand the problem a lot better. And the, the more that we can encourage the conversation between technologists and development professionals, the further we will get towards creating cross-border solutions. Okay. So, of course, the World Bank is a big, huge animal, you know, which is like uh, an, interesting, an interesting organization to start with, with huge amount of countries and, and, and lots of connections. Um, what role does the Blockchain Lab have in the, in the World Bank? And, and, and what part of the organization is it working? And how did it come about? Uh, so, so our president has a very interesting uh, story that he likes to tell about a project that he, he heard about where the World Bank was thinking about investing in telephone poles. And uh, if you think about investing in telephone poles, that's yesterday's technology. And fortunately, someone... Last 100 years, I would say, yeah. <laughs> right. Do you still need telephone poles, right? Uh, so, so fortunately, somebody said, you know, we should really reconsider this. There's probably a better way to do this. <laughs> Uh, but his, his point was that, uh, you know, are we building telephone poles of the future? When we think about what countries want, do they want something that was vetted and proved 50 years ago? Or mm -hmm. do they want the latest solutions that might help them skip a lot of the, the challenges that we've already addressed? And so the blockchain lab is really a shared resource to help people understand a new disruptive technology that might have the potential uh, to, to solve sticky problems in a decentralized way. Okay. And, yeah. And the, yeah. Yeah. So give us some examples of uh, projects you work on and uh, what the stickiness and what the problems are there. And so we get, we get lots of different inquiries. Uh, we're a resource for World Bank Group staff who are interested in working on a blockchain-based solution. So we're trying to help them figure out what the technology is, and, and some of the use cases that have been brought to us are, are very interesting. They, they run the gamut. Uh, there's one on uh, pharmaceutical inventory tracking. So how would you ensure that you have full visibility of a pharmaceutical as it makes its way to a patient? And then how do you uh, reward service providers for the services they provide and make sure that everything is fully transparent and visible, even if you're working in a highly decentralized, low-capacity environment? Uh -huh. that's so that's the, that is the word, the decentralized, low-capacity environment. That is, that is lingo for you know, an environment with a with very weak infrastructure, with a lot of problems, and maybe also a lot of uh, corruption and, and difficult political systems or something like that? Or, or even if you just have a challenging geography where people are in rural areas and you may not, um, maybe it's very expensive to reach them through traditional centralized means. Mm -hmm. Or you might have paper-based processes and people are looking for a way uh, to make a leap forward without having to uh, pave the cow path or digitize processes that are uh, not particularly good to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that's, that is, is sort of a recurring theme in all of this is people talk about M-Pesa and how much that changed people's minds about what's really possible when you give people who are motivated uh, access to technical solutions that allow them to do things that you didn't think were possible. And and the expectations that were set by that example have really raised people's um, hopes about what these new technologies can do, especially when you have local communities that are empowered with the knowledge about how to use them and contextualize them to their own specific situation. Because it's yeah. one thing for me to sit and 
Washington, D.C. and come up with an idea. It's a no, completely no. different thing. No, I, I would yeah. say that's yeah. all immediately horrible. But okay, practical. Tracking and tracing of medicine. I mean, online tracking and tracing of medicine is a problem anyway because 60% is fraudulent on, 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 the, on the internet. So that's a normal business problem, but of course it, it gets multiplied in your environment. What is another example right. you're going to talk about? Um, so another another example is uh, cross-border payments. And so you have this, this challenging issue of de-risking in the Caribbean and the Pacific. You have people who have been dropped out of the financial system because it's too expensive to verify them. And if you think about the, the amount of compliance that the average bank has to do and the fines associated with falling out of compliance, you can, you can see why this happens, why de-risking happens. But unfortunately, it disproportionately impacts people who are trying to remit large sums back to their home countries. Yeah. And if you think about a family that's dependent on somebody who's remitting them back money from wherever they're working outside of their country, and you think about that, that financial relationship being severed, it, it, it no, it's, it's very important. And de-risking means thrown out, being thrown out by the normal banks. Is that de-risking? That is the word for it? That's, that's the word for it. It ends up becoming very confusing because you're thinking de-risking, what is de-risking? But that's, yeah. the, that's the phenomenon. Oh, what, a yeah. horrible, what a horrible word if you, if you know the meaning behind it. I mean, there's billions of people who don't have a bank account. And the ones who, who of course, want to send money back, they, they have to go to Union... Uh, to a Western Union, and then you pay 10% uh, uh, remittance cost. Uh, so there's a lot of, it's, is it, could you say that, uh, I mean, and, and what is the level of, uh, of what the World Bank does? I mean, do you build infrastructure like that, or do you uh, have money and then have other people work with it? What is your, what is the, how does it work? Uh, so, so I don't work on the front lines. So our role in the lab is basically to to prepare in-house prototypes and work with technology partners to support frontline staff who are thinking about, uh, is this a good idea? Is this something that others would be interested in? Uh, is this useful to solve a problem? And then we might, you know, we work with almost every different country. If, if there is a solution that requires consensus, we might be able to bring a few groups together and say, we've created something. Is this a useful idea to take forward and have a discussion about that. And in our experience, having a, having a real prototype, and the, you know, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition is very good at this, having a real prototype that people can see and experience uh, raises the quality of the conversation uh, to a much higher level about yeah. uh, what, what it would actually take. Yeah. Well, this conference has as, a, as the theme from POC, uh, proof of concept to production. We're trying to show all kinds of production, uh, and then because everybody in the last three years, everybody has been doing POX forever, and now we want right. to really see something happening. So we'll challenge you on the uh, during the conference when you do your talk, saying, "Okay, nice, wonderful prototype. When is it really going to happen? Right? And when is it going to be scalable? When is it going to be working?" But we don't have to do that now. That's just I want to prepare you for that question. Now, last question. Good, I have one week to prepare. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Um, uh, the uh, or or in in the subject um, um, is, you know, we we always we have always all kinds of um, wrong picture. I mean, uh, we all know Hans uh, Rosling, who uh, tells us how the real world really is, that it's really not so much bipolar, and that everything is more subtle. But we also think about the the list of how. Um, how transparent companies are, how, how transparent they are, and how corrupt they are. Um, one of the people who comes speaking is from the Prime Minister Office of the Blockchain uh, Work Group uh, of India. You know, they're really, they're, and, and what, what he wants to do is basically clean out the government and make it less corrupt by using blockchain uh, stuff because it cannot be changed. Is there, uh, that, that is, you know, he wants to go top down because, I mean, it's, an, it's a problem everywhere in India. Have you seen examples in that arena that they want to clean, uh, make the government more clean and have systems less um, uh, easy to manipulate? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we've, we've had a use case around anti-corruption in artificial intelligence. Uh, so trying to detect patterns around corruption. Uh, but we haven't actually had one on blockchain. Uh, but it, it's sort of it's sort of an added benefit that once you make a system transparent, it's a lot it's a lot harder to try to cheat it. 
And the big problem with blockchain is going to be garbage in, garbage out. And, and that, I think, is, is this problem to solve. Yes. It's how you make sure that you haven't, uh, you know, put in place a new tool that people can manipulate. Okay. Uh, even if it is uh, very forward thinking in its design. Garbage in, garbage out. That's totally true. And you've been experiencing that. I mean, your background is really interesting. You are Russian. Uh, you started Russian and then you got into IT because, I mean, those two are incredibly related. I mean, the Russians are, tend to be also incredibly good in, uh, in IT because their language is next to impossible. But you've always worked on very <laughs> centralized systems, eh? Oracle and that kind of stuff. Why, having those experience with huge centralized uh, IT systems, what is for you the interesting thing about blockchain as a person? As a professional, well, I you know it's, it's interesting. I think about the sharing economy, and I think about um, individuals wanting to be empowered uh, with data, and I think that requires a new tool set. You know, there's been a lot of conversations lately about how people like centralization, people like platforms that that are that everyone can share, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you you want a little bit of control, and you want to know and um, what's being used where and, and who owns what and how you can potentially benefit uh, from that. And, and I think that requires a larger conversation about some combination of centralization and decentralization. Um, I don't think we're swinging from one pole to the other, but I think we're recognizing that the centralized model doesn't work in all cases. Uh, and that, that's a very interesting thought for me. The, the other thing that I love about this space is that the, the backgrounds of the people who come to speak about blockchain are completely different, and you never know who you're going to get in the room. Uh, you get economists, you get monetary policy people, you get uh, computer scientists, cryptographers, uh, development professionals, uh, people who work in corporations, students, cyberpunks, cyberpunks, all kinds of different backgrounds, different yeah. political beliefs, and it's, it's a really interesting roundtable conversation about okay. the future. We'll show you a couple of them. Uh, we'll show you a couple of them in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm sure you'll have fun having a group of people. Thank you very much, Rachel, from uh, Washington, from a very hot Washington uh, D.C. We'll see you in a nice climate uh, next week in the Netherlands. Thank you. Looking forward to it.